Welcome to Freed on Business. He grew up in South Florida, has been in business here since the early 90s, and has closed over $3 billion in deals. He's seen it all. He always has an opinion, and he's always ready to share it. Informed, entertaining, and connected, he has his finger on the pulse of South Florida's business community. He's Jim Freed, and this is Freed on Business. Hey, I'm here. I've been voguing for everybody that's watching. I want to thank Beth Azor for giving me the vibe. We've got a tremendous show. Anybody who remembers our show on Office Space and commented how great that was, just wait. We're going to blow the top off of that on this one. We're going to do retail today. That's right, Beth Azor. We're going to do retail today. We're going to set the table with Casey Conway, the Red Shoe Economist. We've got my two friends, Russ Borenstein, who does tenant rep work. We've got Lori Schneider, who does ownership work. We've got Beth Azor, who's an investor and an advisor. And, of course, we'll be joined in a little while by Charles Faschini because he's in such demand. He's going from speech to speech. So we'll be back right after this. I want to actually give everybody one chance to say what they think is going on with retail in about five words. Casey, is retail dead? No, it's not. It's a Lego movie. Uh, everything's awesome again. Russ, what's going on with retail? On fire in South Florida. Lori? Pent up to men. We're seeing it every day. Beth? The five Fs are back. Oh, I got to ask her what that is. We'll be back after this to find out what the five Fs are and how hot it is down in South Florida. Woo! Back after this. Everybody, we're South Florida's longest running business talk show. We've been on since 2008. That's right, we've now made it through two recessions. You'll hear why I think we're through the second one now, too. All right, remember, everybody, when you're looking to buy or lease a car, you want to get every chance that you can, every advantage that you can. That's why I have to work with my friends at Warren Henry. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody there, Larry, Bob, everybody, Samantha. We love you all. Uh, when you're looking to buy or lease a car, you want to get every advantage that you can. That's why you have to check out Warren Henry, Land Rover, Range Rover, Land Rover, Range Rover, Infinity and Jaguar. I had to catch my breath. I got a lender calling me already to do a loan. All right, everybody. Remember, down in Key West, they've got out. I, oh, down in Key West, they've got them all. And up in Gainesville, they've got out. Oh, my gosh, I'm off my game this morning. But we'll get back on it. What do they all have in common? They come with a Warren Henry advantage. That's a bunch of great things, including complimentary service loaner, dynamic wheel protection, key replacement, guaranteed purchase offer, best value guarantee, and a 72-hour exchange. You can exchange your car for the first three days. Nobody ever does it. Join me, my friends, my beautiful wife, Vivian. We're all members of the Warren Henry family. You should be to visit their newly constructed store at 151st and Biscayne. That's right. Why? Because... Oh, I keep getting mixed up now. Always the best price, always the best service, always more than Henry. I got too much business. <laughs> That's right. If you want to do a real estate deal with somebody kind, call me. I think by now, you know, I have just what it takes to get your deal done. If you need a residential deal. I wrote up two of those this morning. One for a big pension fund advisor who got messed around by, well, I can't say the name of the bank. Anyway, so call me. I'm doing jumbo mortgages for them. And what else am I doing? Well, I think you might have read that I just did a $90 million deal in downtown Miami. You need something creative? Call me. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you, guys. Call me if you need some help on anything real estate. I've obviously got access to the top minds in real estate. If I can't get it done, I know who can. Give me a call at 305-773-6300. DM me. Why? Because when you call me, it is always all about you. Welcome back to Freedom Business. Connect with us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at Jim Freed or at Freedom Business and on Instagram at Jim Freed One. Now, back to your host, 
Jim Freed. All right, everybody. We're going to rock the world today. We're going to talk about what's going on in retail. Everybody thinks retail is dead. Wrong. Retail is rocking. Yes, I live in South Florida, which is absolutely on fire in every sector, but retail is hot across the country. We've got KC Conway to tell us how it's evolving, and then we're going to do some great discussion with some of the best minds I know in the retail space and Russ Bornstein. Thanks. <laughs> KC, you're on. Um, I didn't know. I didn't just thought you were still going. <laughs> no, I, I, you were Russ, and then that was it. Let, let me uh, off the hook, will you? So you know it's gonna make your panel so great. So they're actually you got you've got some older than dirt people on here. There actually is an older than dirt construction company. That's for the guys. For Beth and Lori, they're prettier than pearls. So you got prettier than pearls and older than dirt here to tell you about retail. So this is the year I, I, I mentioned at the end of last year, beginning of this year, that 2021 would be the year of retail. We're rediscovering it. And I went back in my library, you know, one of the great things about being a scarred third generation guy is you you collect and keep a lot of stuff, even in paper. So in 1992, Robin Ellis pro, uh, published this uh, retail outlook from 1972 to 1992. It reads like a good Yogi Berra quote. It's like deja vu all over again. Retail is always reinventing itself. It's going through another reinvention phase. You got a great panel here. You're going to hear about more stores opening than closing, more innovation. Um, offices go into the malls that are regenerating that activity that are great creating life back around the ancillary stuff around the mall. And just don't pay attention to this bad government uh, data like the uh, um, uh, a durable goods report this morning that said, oh my gosh, it's down minus 1% or whatever, and we need more stimulus in the economy. No, we don't. The reason durable goods were down is nobody can get anything through the supply chain. I'm doing a home renovation. It was six months to get appliances, um, but retail is doing very well. It's a lot more service oriented. And in those states where people are moving to, like Florida, so Florida, Texas, always like number one, two, or three, we're, we're moving to those type states in the South and the inland markets with good fiscal balance and and uh, and whatnot that's driving population and as beth and uh, and others and russell will tell you retail always follows the rooftops and they're going to follow the rooftops to florida so it's all Bro, good i joked you are one of the smartest guys i know um you work with some of the biggest tenants um covet has picked some winners and losers we just talked a little bit about the supply chain i know that you've been working on a new house too so you've had that experience Tell me a little bit about how you see winners and losers in the post-COVID retail world. Well, if you look at uh, who, has, who has thrived and who has barely survived in South Florida, uh, if you look at the grocery stores, they're having some of their best years they've ever had. So where did all that food business came, come from? It came from the sit-down restaurants, the, the standard sit-down restaurants that we all know, the Applebee's, the Chili's, that service. So they were the losers. But the restaurant business in general wasn't a wasn't a total loser. Anybody with a with a drive through lane has also thrived. I've got a Chipotle in one of my centers, and they had their best year ever this in in 2020. And you're seeing everybody go to the drive through lanes. If you look at the Chick Fil A's, double drive through lanes. They can't they can't keep them. Uh, that you know they they can't get them through fast enough. Um, appliance retailers have done very well. People are at home, right? Uh, people need computers. They need printers. They need, uh, they're wearing out their refrigerators and freezers. So appliance retailers have done very well. Anybody that you have contact with seems to have, have, have uh, taken a hit. The gyms, the movie theaters, the Chuck E. Cheeses, those have taken a hit. But the, uh, the ones that I just mentioned are doing very well. Now, Beth, you own a lot of retail. Um, you've had some big <clears throat> dynamics. Are you seeing some larger tenants come? Where might they be coming from? What they might they be doing? And why are they coming here? Yes, Jim, I've had a Michaels vacancy for about two and a half years, 21,000 square feet. And I've been targeting and prospecting and canvassing for that box. And in the last two weeks, I've had two LOIs signed. Amazing. And the one that I'm going with is a gym from... California with seven locations, and they are moving their entire operation from California. They just bought a house in South Florida, and I'm excited to have them join uh, my shopping center and plantation. 
So they're coming to Florida as a response to the regulation in California, and they're a low-tech business. Fabulous. Lori, what are you seeing in the triple net space? Um, well, in the okay, uh, I'd like to address both shopping centers and net lease. Oh, great. Please. If, if I may. Yeah, of there, there's the, well, there's a very big difference between the two. So now anything that can create a good, durable income stream is very much in demand for many reasons, um, predominantly the looking at us as safe yield and people who are concerned about volatility and other or, or lack of yield in any of their alternatives. Uh, there's haves and have nots, certainly a net lease tenant that can't show that they've been able to make it through the last year successfully. You're just not going to get the activity. And we're doubling down on activity on those sectors that are more popular. And within, within shopping centers, if I have to make generalizations, and I'd say that anything that is not overbuilt, that's gross or anchored, we're getting more demand than before in Florida. Um, I've sold in and out of Florida during the pandemic, and I can say that on the quality stuff, I got pre-pandemic pricing and then some. That's tremendous. That is really tremendous. Um, we're just being joined by his financial uh, geniusness himself, Charles Ficini. Charles, welcome to the show. I'm going to ask you to unmute Charles. And um, when we come back right after a short break, we're going to start with Charles. Charles will talk a little bit about the capital markets perspective on retail. And uh, we'll get a little feedback from Casey and our panel. So if you're looking to buy some retail, stick with us because we're going to talk about the financing right after this. Reagan Mendoza, it's all yours. South Florida's longest running business talk show been on since 2008, 600 and some odd episodes in the can. And I got all my good friends with me today. When you want to accomplish something and feel good about it, surround yourself with friends. It works every time. Hey, you want to know who else are my friends? My friends are Larry, Warren, Eric, uh, Samantha, all my friends, Abe, and Warren Henry got Abe's hat on over here. When you're looking to buy or lease a car, you want to get every advantage that you can. That's why you have to check out Warren Henry. Land Rover, Range Rover, Infinity and Jaguar down here at 151st and Biscayne in their new store. Up in Gainesville, that's right, Go Gators. Sorry, Beth, had to say it. Go Gators, I know, she's a big Seminole fan. But up in Gainesville, there you go. There you go. I was soliciting that, Beth. <laughs> up in Gainesville, they sell Audis. Down in the Keys, they sell them all. That's where I'm going to go get my Jeep. Why do you want to work with Warren Henry? Well, besides the fact that they have great cars, they got the Warren Henry Advantage, all these great things that they come with, complimentary debt, complimentary service loan, or I was going to say complimentary debt service. I want that loan. Uh, complimentary <laughs> service loan, or dynamic wheel protection, gear replacement, guaranteed purchase offer, best value guarantee, the 72-hour purchase, a uh, 72-hour exchange. You can trade your car in if you don't like it after three days. You'll love your car. My mom, my wife, me, my friends, we all go to Warren Henry. You should too. Always the best price, always the best service, always Warren Henry. I love you. Carlson from Carlson Integrated. You know, a lot of our clients find that they can do anything, but not really everything. We are always excited to jump in and help. So whether you need another set of hands for a project or even comprehensive marketing management, our team of marketing mavens would love to have a conversation with you to see if we are the right fit. We do everything from logo and design work to email outreach and social media to writing and thought leadership. And here's a fun one. We are now offering our fabulous ebook of top 10 marketing tips on our website for free. So head over to carlsonintegrated.com and grab a copy today. And please always let us know how we can help. 
My email is Becca, that's B-E-K-A-H at carlsonintegrated.com. That's B-E-K-A-H at carlsonintegrated.com. Look out, here I come again. She's tremendous. You know, Rebecca helped me build my brand and help me maintain my brand. If you need any help on that, you should reach out to Rebecca too. Like my brand? What's my brand? My brand is that I self-actualize by helping other people achieve their dreams. So call me and let me help you achieve your dreams. I'm helping lots of my friends and their kids buy their first homes. I'm helping my friends refinance and pull money out. That's on the jumbo mortgage side, but that's just the sideline. My biggest deal just closed yesterday. $90 million condo bridge loan. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you, Beth. You're coming on again. Yes, <laughs> I got to, I can have you guys on every show. It's just my friend. We're having fun and we're loving it up here. So if you want to join this positive energy crew and do commercial real estate with me, call me at 305-773-6300. I know everybody. They pick up the phone. That's all you need. Why call me? Because when you call me, it's always all about you. Welcome back to Freedom Business. Connect with us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at Jim Freed or at Freedom Business and on Instagram at Jim Freed One. Now, back to your host, Jim Freed. All right, I'm surrounded by some of my best friends here, people that I love that I Twitter and tweet with all the time. Russ Bornstein, Lori Schneider, Beth Azor, Casey Conway, the Red Shoe Economist, and of course, the second hottest finance guy in town, how to say it, Charles? Charles Fischini. <laughs> so, so listen, Charles. You know, Jim, I love you. take your moment in this time, but remember, it's just a moment. <laughs> I love you, man. I'm just complimenting you. You're the new guy on the block. We've been talking about real estate. I want you to set the table a little bit. Give me a couple of minutes on how the capital markets are looking at retail, and then we'll go back to Casey and go around the horn again. Sure. I, you know, I would tell you last year in the pandemic it was the first time in my career, 22 billion worth of financing that I had a deal under application and rate locked. It was two centers, one was Publix anchored, one was not. And the life company walked away, gave us our deposit back and unwound their hedge of the loss. And I, I just couldn't believe it, both with the strength of the assets and the strength of the sponsorship. And you know, since that time, retail has had a tough road, um, but there is a road for them to be on. And the markets have come back substantively. It's not easy, uh, but it's there's been a substantive improvement. So if you're looking for a loan today and you're a grocery anchored center, that's the gold standard pre-pandemic. It's the gold standard now. Um, not only are a lot of those tenants credit or viewed like a credit, but they're also now viewed as essential, which is a new word that we hadn't experienced before. And so um, you know, you can get 60 to almost 70% loan to value. You can get substantial interest only periods and you can get rates in the low threes. Um, so it's probably the best financing amongst the commercial assets at this point in time. You know, if you're a neighborhood center, you're being looked at like a hotel. Um, what's your performance? How did you do? How did you do during the pandemic? Who did you lose? Who paid rent? Have you recovered your cams? You know, if the answer to that is yes, um, you know, if you had a dining restaurant, probably not so good. If you had a pizza parlor, that's almost a credit tenant, right? Those guys are off the chain. It's very hard to pick winner and losers in the pandemic. No one could have looked forward and said restaurants will fail and pizza guys will become multimillionaires because they can't keep up. So those types of centers can get loans. Um, they're more bank and CMBS. They're 60% leverage, some interest only rates tipping up to three and a half to three and three quarters. Um, power centers, I would lump in the same. If it's more credit and more essential, healthcare, walk-in urgent care, things of that nature, you may wind up getting a loan closer to a grocery anchored center. If it's retail that's private equity owned, non-essential, um, scarier, uh, it may not be. And things have flipped. You know, um, nobody wanted a Goodwill or some of those depositories in, in their in their strip centers. Everybody loves those now because their sales remain strong and they were viewed to be essential by many measures. And probably the, the weakest link is, is where I would be um, is in the malls. And so most 
most of the big malls that we recognize are really all owned by institutional capital or REITs and they borrow at a corporate level uh, or just issue new shares of stocks. But if you're a large private owner of malls, very, very difficult to get something done. Um, if you're looking at those malls and have an opportunity to refinance them for an alternative use, there is debt fund money available and construction money available. But where most debt fund deals today are pricing in the three to 4%, that's viewed very opportunistically. I would say if you can access the capital, most times it'll be closer to 7%. And um, you know that's if you're looking at an empty block and you're going to reconfigure that as a school or reconfigure that as a health center or reconfigure it as a footing for an apartment development or something like that. Um, so there is capital, but it's very, very case by case. Depends on the asset, their performance recently, their performance historically, the tenant mix, and of course, the operator. Well, thank you so much, Charles. That's right on point. And I want to go back to Beth, who's an owner who's always looking for capital. Beth, so we've heard Charles. So now that we've heard Charles' overview of the capital markets, you as a, as a uh, retail property owner, how does that impact you on your strategic thinking? So I'm all retail. I'm all in retail. I didn't know that I bought essential retail. I'm so happy I did, but I did. You know, uh, strip centers parallel to high trafficked uh, streets with restaurants like Panera, Mission Barbecue, La Spada Subs. I, I have 109 tenants. I lost one during the pandemic, one local, and then I lost Pier 1 in Kirkland's. So they would have gone anyway. They weren't pandemic related. But when you buy a plus real estate, it survives because the sales are there and sales is what drives success and, and security. So absolutely, I'm in the middle of a development and I just got an extension on my IO loan with a community bank. I have signed on the note, so I'm not running away anytime mm -hmm. soon. And so I, but I would the only thing I would say is I would stay far away from power centers. I, I think power centers is the next shoe to drop. And certainly malls, you know, we're, we're predicting 30% of the thousand malls in the country will close for the uses that Charles had said, multifamily, healthcare, um, industrial, industrial, last mile logistics. I, I'm not sure about schools. So I think the whole school thing is out there and questionable. She said shoe drop. That's your cue, Casey. <laughs> so, so what Charles uh, really told us, it's the year of Yogi. So here's another great Yogi quote. After his 1960s loss to the Pirates in the World Series, he made the statement, we make too many wrong mistakes. So Charles, that life company, I bet today they're looking back saying we made a wrong mistake there. And what, what Beth has in, in her assets, she's very good at this, our CCIM current uh, president, uh, Tim Blair, has a term where they invest in retail. And they call it fluent, fluent, fluence density, where you have the combination of influence and density. And so what you've figured out very well, mm -hmm. Beth, is how to find that influence in the neighborhood and market with the density of the households that are still going to be there. And just because one retailer fails or goes out in a building doesn't make that distressed real estate. And just like an office tenant moves out to make it a distressed office building. So um, the, you know, the other thing I think that's going to be interesting to watch here is how we really uh, deploy adaptive reuse with retail. So whether it's office, um, you know, going to the mall, and we're seeing lots of office uh, entities and whatnot moving in there, they're recreating vitality around the mall. The other thing is we're seeing entities like Amazon say when we go into a market and we do uh, a big new e-commerce warehouse, they're simultaneously looking for up to three to five empty big box stores. And what are they doing with them? It's called retail to industrial conversion. And so they'll buy these things at 50 to 60 bucks a square foot. They'll put a new roof with skylights on it. They'll upgrade the paving from asphalt to concrete. And then guess what they do? They put a new lease on it, a 20 year Amazon lease, it makes it an investment grade credit. And now it's industrial. So all those life companies, Charles, are looking for industrial. They now have an industrial asset with a triple net lease. <laughs> so Lori likes that. And these things are selling for 120 bucks a square foot. And the key is understanding, like whether you decide to do business or some other tool, where are those demographic powers and the influence and the density? And what Amazon does is they look at where high percentage of the packages go to zip codes. And they look for the closed Kmart, the Toys R Us, the 
um, you know, electronic store, and that's what they're doing. So, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, industrial going into there, whether it's office going into the mall and regenerating it, um, uh, you know, it's 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 happening. And we can buy these assets that are on sale today at a fraction of replacement cost. The last thing that Beth said, very important. Um, and so, Charles, you're probably finding this. Hug a community banker. The community banks have been there all the live long day. They were there with the PPP loans. They've been there before that. They're the ones that can think um, and actually work through a deal and structure something. The larger institutions are afraid of their shadow right now. They're afraid of the bank regulators. And so whether it's the Bank of Tampa or something else in South Florida, they're the ones that can think through. And if you're having trouble, look at them. And if all else fails and it's under, say, $5 million, go call them. <laughs> Credit unions are big commercial real estate lenders again, and they work very well. So I'll stop there. That's right. I, I would just. Lori, what do you see? Oh, sorry, Charles. You wanted to say something? Go ahead. Jim, you know, Jim, you took credit for being the best mortgage banker ever. I want to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just, Casey, you made a lot of good points, but I, I have two thoughts. One is if I'm in Beth's shoes and you represented tenants for many, many decades before you became an owner of real estate, do you want Amazon taking that end cap? Are they going to drive the type of traffic that your other higher paying tenants would want the same way that Publix would or, or another grocer? And then from the standpoint of community banks, I want to make a very important distinction that most times they're all or mostly recourse. So they're not only looking at the quality of the asset and the operator, they're saying, how much money does that operator have in the bank? Is there a negative covenant that if they have problems with that asset going forward, that I can capture their wealth management account or something like that and, and get protected? So that recourse distinction is, is very important. It is, but Charles, I'll tell you, I'll take recourse over a special servicer trying to help me out in a problem any day long. So <laughs> I'll take, I'll deal with the community banker on recourse than a special servicer on a on a CMBS loan. I'm sorry, I just bad, bad experiences with all the CMBS industry. Well, and and <laughs> I think the community bankers were there for us during COVID. Boy, were they there? I, I have CMBS and community bankers, and the bankers were there. But to answer your question, Charles. I only would want Amazon if I needed the credit in the center. So if I had credit in the center, then I absolutely would pass on the credit and, and want to attract uh, the traffic. But if I needed credit because I had a lot of traffic generators that were local, unique mom and pop operators, then I would take the credit. So sorry, Lori, Lori I didn't mean to jump on you. Lori. Yes, I, I'd like to address a few things. I think that um, each of the buyers is really defined what it is they're looking for in a lender. And for the first time ever, there's a lot less sensitivity to LTV. Um, before, I think that anybody who was looking to, to put out their capital um, is now willing to shift. They're willing to go to 60% LTV where before they wouldn't have considered it. But if they're not willing to take recourse, they still won't. And if they want IO, they certainly want it now. So that, you know, those that are looking for the yield will overlook certain aspects of both the assets as, as well as the debt. And Charles, you might be experiencing the same. And when it comes when it comes to Amazon or some other alternative use tenants, um, we have no experience on what it's going to look like to the market. And right now, I think that as a landlord, you have no choice. Uh, if you haven't to put in the tenant that we, is going to give you what you anticipate to be um, the best prospect, but we don't know what that's going to do long term to the tenants. And it's possible that there's a trade off because there's been a lot of concern lately over co tenancy clauses. And we don't know what the Amazon effect is going to be on those. Russ? I don't want Amazon over Publix. But I certainly want them over Kmart or over another another a linens and things or an HH Greg or one of those tenants. And were those tenants really helping the center at all? Anyhow, is Kmart really bringing anybody into your center? Um, so you know that's my feeling about that. Um, you know, we learned a lot about tenants during this, didn't we? You know, it, it's uh, we learned a lot about ourselves during COVID. We learned a lot about tenants, right? It's the, the ability to pay and the desire to pay. And we all know uh, a, a coffee-related breakfast retailer that came in and gave everybody a haircut when they didn't need to. And uh, talking about a big mistake, 
Uh, I think that's hurt them right now in growth because I don't think a lot of uh, buyers are interested in acquiring their property. So I, I'm going to defer to Lori, but I think that cap rate's gone up. And I don't think, given an op an, another alternative, that a lot of landlords want them as a tenant. They've, they kind of showed their true colors. There is a restaurant in Boca Raton that was doing $14 million in sales right near Town Center Mall. And two months after COVID came, they stopped paying their rent. $14 million in sales. They've been doing it for 20 years, and they can't pay two months worth of rent. So I think we learned a lot about the retailers during this. I think that our memories are so incredibly short that some of the things that you said we would never forget have already been forgotten. It's shocking. Not mine. Not and mine. All, no, not yours, because you're, you're doing the leasing and you understand it. But sometimes on the investment sales side, mm -hmm. um, it's surprising. They don't know some of the transgressions, some of these tenants that you were not, not discussing mm -hmm. uh, had done. And one of the saddest stories that, are, that I'll never forget from the pandemic was I have a very large retail owner who said that one of his tenants who had been the, the pizzeria for 30 something years apologized for being two weeks late because his dad died of COVID. Mm -hmm. they, they, there is no chance that somebody who's committed to their business is going to not pay rent. And those tenants that looked at his financial engineering, unfortunately, a lot of us have given them a hall pass. So well, it's well, almost incumbent upon those in this room to keep that memory alive and remember that what happened before is something we should we should pay heed. Well, as well, someone said, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a break and then we'll be right back and we're gonna talk about some of the lessons we've learned that we need to remember. Reagan, rock it. everybody is where i say we're south florida's longest running business talk show we've been on since 20 2008 i almost said 2012 that's when we got warren henry warren henry i want to thank larry warren uh samantha and the rest of the team over at warren henry when you're looking to buy or lease a car you want to get every advantage that you can that's why you have to check out warren henry land rover range rover infinity and jaguar up in Gainesville, they sell Audi. Down in the Keys, well, they sell them all. What do they all have in common? Well, they're all great cars, and they come with the Warren Henry Advantage. That's a suite of services that you get when you buy your Warren Henry car. You get complimentary service loaner, dynamic wheel protection, key replacement, guaranteed purchase offer, best value guarantee, and my favorite, the 72-hour exchange. You can take three days to make sure you love your car. Guess what? You will. So join me, my mom, my beautiful wife, Vivian, and all of our friends. We're all members of the Warren Henry family. You should be too. Always the best price, always the best service, always Warren Henry. pays off. Look at the people on the show today. They're all tremendous. They wouldn't have anything to do with you if you weren't kind and nice. They don't got time for that. So everybody, let's try to be kind out there. Also, give me a call if I can help you. You want to deal with somebody kind? Boy, was that kind? I hope so. Give me a call at 305-773-6300. I like to bring a little humor and a lot of fun to the game, but I also bring all my contacts. They're deep, they're wide. I get things done. Residential, commercial, can't get it done. Call me. I can. 305-773-6300. Why call me? Because when you call me, it's always all about you. Welcome back to Freedom Business. Connect with us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at Jim Freed or at Freedom Business and on Instagram at Jim Freed One. Now, back to your host, Jim Freed. All right, I talked about the fact that I wanted to talk about lessons learned, but I think that's best in the last segment of the show. So why don't we do this? Let's talk about one of the big advantages of retail that's always under threat of the politicians, the 1031. Casey, what's up with the 1031? 
Um, it, you know, it's a popular thing to demagogue and try to think that, you know, uh, it's a it's a tax loophole and it's not. In fact, in Florida, the foundation research that was done on this topic was by Dr. Ling at the University of Florida. Oh, man. Um, I think he's visited Florida State, Beth, um, but Look he's done the all the foundation Look work. He's done all the foundation work for the National Association of Realtors. He did it five years ago when it was under attack and really explained that most 1031s are to people under $10 million. It's an important tool for business succession and small business growth. You outgrow one thing, you, you, you go into the other. It's not big assets. It's not big entities making a, you know, a, ta a tax dodge. He's working on updating that right now. So thank you, Florida. Thank you, Dr. Ling at the Kelly Bergstrom uh, Real Estate Center for that foundation work. Um, they're going to talk a lot about it, it's not going to get touched. When they do the homework and realize what it really does to small business who they're supposed to be behind, they'll find a new shiny object to go dis get distracted on. And as well, uh, Chairman Powell and um, uh, um, Jay Powell and a uh, new Treasury Secretary, uh, Janet Yellen, both understand this. And at Treasury and the Fed, they're not going to allow it to advance. So they'll talk a lot about it. Don't get stressed. It's, it's with us. Don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, Laura, you do a lot of 1031s. Is, are people stressing or do you kind of basically hear the same thing that KC says? We were and we're not anymore. Ugh. That's all, that's already, that's already, it's, 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 so, a few, so a few months ago and I'm, I'm with you. I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. It's easy. That's the consensus. I think we also believe in our lobbying power. So they, the losses would be too profound. Well, I think that pretty much says the whole thing. Beth, thoughts? I've been seeing, you know, I'm about to um, do a big deal with a uh, triple net user and I'm getting calls. When, when can we buy it? We have a 1031. So that has died down a little bit recently, but for two or three months, it was rabid because I think people were worried it was going away. So um, I'm so glad to hear you, Casey, because I talked to someone yesterday and they're like, no, it, you know, it's going to go away. I'm like, it's not going away. So I'm now going to say that you said. Absolutely. Red shoe economist guarantees it. And I think Charles will even tell you that, you know, from a from a standpoint, there's a shortage. I do a lot of property tax uh, appeal work. And, um, you know, you look at the stratification and other than really fast food restaurants, you don't have big branch banks anymore. You don't have big box because of lease accounting that's coming uh, here in another 24 months that, you know, the big Walmarts and Home Depots, they don't want to have these leases become liabilities on the balance sheet. So the product isn't there. And we actually have a shortage of products. So the cap rates are actually compressing on 1031. So that's another good, a good piece of news. Well, Charles, he asked you, what are you seeing? I would agree. I mean, from Clittle's standpoint, just like what I do for a living, I, people should buy real estate or sell real estate on fundamentals. Um, interest rates is a component. Tax advantages are a component. But if the fundamental real estate doesn't work, you shouldn't buy it. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's a lot less transactions at the moment outside of the multifamily space. And historically, there has been. And I would expect that to continue. And, and I don't believe the 1031 discussion will become a relevant issue in my career. Okay, I got to ask you, Russ, what do you think? I mean, at the beginning of the show, you you said you had five very smart people in me. So I, I've got to defer to the five very smart people who uh, uh, who, who are, are experts in this field. But I don't think it's going anywhere. I think there's too much fees and too much uh, at stake here for the various municipalities that the, for these pr properties need to be sold and transferred there they bring them up to the current tax base if they're well under and that's very important to the municipalities in the state so i don't i don't see it going anywhere but i'll defer to the smart people all right well the smart people have spoken and i want to talk about the lessons that we've learned so reagan heads up we're going to take this early break now and then we're going to talk about lessons learned i know we have some guests that are going to start having to leave at the end of the show so let's get to the lessons learned first uh, real quick. So Reagan, take it away. Then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the lessons that people have learned in the last 13 months. Reagan, yours. Bye. 
everybody. Like I always like to say, and I'm proud to say, we're South Florida's longest running business talk show. We've been on since 2008. Thank you so much to our key sponsors at Warren Henry. They've been with us since 2012. Thank you, Warren, Eric, Larry, and Samantha. And remember, when you're looking to buy or lease a car, you want to get every advantage that you can. That's why you have to check out Warren Henry, Land Rover, Range Rover, Infinity, and Jaguar up in Gainesville. That's north. They sell Audis down in the Keys. That's south. They sell everything. What do all those cars have in common? Well, they're all great cars, and they come with the Warren Henry Advantage. The Warren Henry Advantage is complimentary service loaner, dynamic wheel protection, key replacement, guaranteed purchase offer, best value guarantee, and, of course, the 72-hour exchange. You can trade in your car for up to three days after you buy it with no impact. So join me, my mom, and my beautiful wife, Vivian, lots of my friends, too. We're all members of the Warren Henry family. You should be, too. Always the best price. Always the best service. You got it. Always Warren Henry. Carlson from Carlson Integrated. You know, a lot of our clients find that they can do anything, but not really everything. We are always excited to jump in and help. So whether you need another set of hands for a project or even comprehensive marketing management, our team of marketing mavens would love to have a conversation with you to see if we are the right fit. We do everything from logo and design work to email outreach and social media to writing and thought leadership. And here's a fun one. We are now offering our fabulous ebook of top 10 marketing tips on our website for free. So head over to carlsonintegrated.com and grab a copy today. And please always let us know how we can help. My email is Becca, that's B-E-K-A-H at carlsonintegrated.com. That's B-E-K-A-H at carlsonintegrated.com. I love that commercial. She smiles and her voice is just so tremendous. Hey, everybody, give me a call. Let's work together on a real estate deal. 305-773-6300. I do jumbo mortgages. I had two calls today for a jumbo mortgage. Yesterday, I closed the biggest deal of my career. Sorry, Charles. I'm no Charles Fashini, you know, but uh, I closed the biggest deal of my career. And today, I got two residential calls. Go figure. It's great. It's great. Keeps the doors open. I'm working on them big deals, too. In fact, the big deals are cooking on right after the show. So give me a call at 305-773-Bridge Loans, all that other stuff. You know what I do. Call me. Why? Because when you call me, it's always all about you. Welcome back to Freedom Business. Connect with us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter at Jim Freed or at Freedom Business and on Instagram at Jim Freed One. Now, back to your host, Jim Freed. All right, everybody. This, this, sec- this segment is dedicated to Lori Schneider, who m- want to make sure that we don't forget the lessons that we learn. So, Lori, we're going to record them just for you, and we'll let you start. What lessons okay. did you learn? Yeah, I did that to you on purpose, but I gave you a, I gave you a few minutes to think. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. A, a, a lot to say because I think it's very nuanced. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all the same way that we shouldn't put our centers all in the same bucket. They've turned more into services than they are necessarily goods. Um, some of our tenants are also expanding in terms of what, how, the way that they are interacting with it, with their, with consumers. So, um, if there's, if there's one thing that frustrated me with that throughout the, the pandemic, it was when people made generalizations regarding tenant performance, um, what was going to survive and, and what wasn't, you have to think about what this, what the attributes of the property are and who who the who the tenants are what sectors they're in and um i think that that would be you know if if that in itself is a lesson then it's think deeper think harder use your resources and make good decisions don't just don't 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 just listen to the rhetoric so focus on yourself stay the course and trust your gut focus on yourself Mm. (laughs) Mm, that was very impressive. Self-care. Yeah. Self-care yeah. comes first. If you can't take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of anybody else? And right? I was thinking when the going gets tough, the tough get going. But 
I like to use a hard boiled egg as my example. I did it to somebody yesterday. I showed them a, 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 a pot of hard boiled eggs and I said, you got to be like the egg for Passover. As the water gets hotter, you got to get tougher. Ross, and, we, and, we, and we are resilient. Huh? We well, are resilient. I'm resilient just to surround myself with my friends, people that believe in me. That's the way you stay resilient. Russ? Yes, sir. What did we learn? Well, um, first of all, those of us that are on this call have all gone through. You, you mentioned the show's been through two cycles. I think we've been through five cycles. If you, if you include the, uh, the SNL crisis, the dot-com bus, 9-11, where you couldn't give space away, uh, 2008, this, uh, this last one. So we've Russian all been debt through it. Crisis, so Charles. so uh, I think we've, we've learned uh, uh, persistence pays off and, and we're always going to bounce back, right? Certainly in South Florida. But um, Lori, again, I think you learned a lot about the tenants. The tenants are the lifeblood. If the tenants don't pay the landlords. The landlords aren't paying the mortgage. So it all starts with the tenants. Um, those that behaved well, um, I, I think we have to look at them uh with uh with with a with a different uh uh different look than maybe uh those that didn't per perform uh perform so well and as i said some of those had the ability to pay and just chose not to pay so i think we learned a lot of, about the tenants um i think we learned a lot about the spaces and our centers uh let's talk about drive-through lanes all of a sudden, uh, those became like gold. And I represented one of the major banks and we were getting rid of branches with drive-through lanes. And most of you know that you saw our branches with drive-through lanes stayed open. So we took a step back and a deep breath and said, those are a little bit more important. Um, and any of the branches that we're selling that have drive-through lanes are like gold. So I think we learned uh, a lot about that. We learned about, um, uh, we learned about the tenants. We learned about landlords. I'm a landlord also. And uh, I had every tenant ask me for rent breaks, no matter who it was, right? Uh, we gave breaks to those tenants that no kidding needed it, uh, like one of the ones that, that Lori spoke about. But there were those that didn't need it and they, and they didn't get it. And then Lori says that we have short memories and I'll wrap this up. But Beth and I are, are, are participants in a, a real estate group that's probably got the top 25 uh, real estate personnel in South Florida and it well, 24 in May, as you would say, Jim. And there is a uh, there came out a, uh, a chart that showed who's paying rent, and who's not paying rent. I think it was put out by a company called Dadex. And I can tell you, we were scouring that on a monthly basis as soon as that came out. And as a t as a tenant rep, I was using that against uh, against those that weren't paying rent. I represent a big bank, and I told, and we were paying ninety nine point nine percent of our rent. So we used that. So that's what, that's what we learned about ourselves, and to to enjoy our family, enjoy our friends, and to live in love. Beth. So I learned that the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. I know that we are uh, we've we are uh, simulcasting this also on Clubhouse. And I have held two clubhouse events called Space Tank, where I have uh, collaborated with 74 landlords. That was the second show. And we have matched 31 mom and pop businesses that either wanted to try new concepts or try new markets. I convinced the 74 landlords to, to commit to 90 days free rent. And the small mom and pops had to pay a depo small deposit, pay utilities, take space as is, and give insurance. And I came up with that idea because during COVID, I signed nine leases and seven were pop-ups. Since then, seven of the nine have become permanent tenants. So entrepreneurialism is hot. This is the year of the mom and pop, not just the year of the retail, because the nationals aren't even traveling yet. They still have travel bans. So for creative, smart landlords, that see the opportunity and see the uniqueness and see the traffic drivers that mom and pops can bring. Yes, there's a credit issue, but we can get through that. And, and exactly who paid rent during the pandemic? The mom and pops. Charles, what lessons did you learn? You know, Jim, I, I think the lessons that I learned uh, in my career and investment in life all filter through the same lens. And I would tell you that uh, the first is diversity. You know, diversity as an investor, diversity as a landlord. You couldn't predict what tenants had moral compasses and what tenants didn't um, just by the credit of their rating. You couldn't predict that a 
boats. I bought a boat last year before the pandemic. I owned one for 15 years and sold it. I wish I had them both because my <laughs> old one is worth way more than I paid for it 15, now 16 years ago. And my new one's worth 30% more than I paid for it because there's a year waiting list. I could not predict that. And under no circumstances is buying a boat a good investment, but today it is, <laughs> right? So you need to diversify because with all the acumen that we have collectively, you could not pick some of the winners and losers. And you know, along the same realms, you need to be flexible. You need to understand when you wake up in the morning, and I've been going to the gym for 30 years of my life, may not look like it, but I always try. Um, I couldn't go to the gym anymore. So I had to go for a walk. I had to do something else, right? And, and the same thing uh, in business. You know, I, I prided our team on our flexibility and our diversity and the types of loans that we do. Last year, close to 100% of my volume was agency business. That's because the agencies put an S on their chest and said, we're going to make loans. Didn't help retail owners, didn't help office owners, but my multifamily owners got interest rates lower than they could ever have expected. And in the same moment in time, they were the most profitable loans for Cadia as a privately held company had ever done. And then finally, um, and Jim, you talk all about this a lot and, and I applaud you for it, but it gave you a chance to see what really mattered in your life. And for all the success that we have collectively and all the stuff that we got, you know, what did I really miss? Um, I missed the ability to go fishing whenever I wanted because the marinas were closed. Um, I didn't miss my family because I hold them close and I'm with them every day. Um, but I sure missed my mother and father who anytime I flew to New York for business would make a side trip to New Jersey and see them. And I couldn't do that for close to a year. It wasn't safe for them. It wasn't safe for me. Who could have ever predicted that? But flexibility, I taught my dad how to use FaceTime. So, you know, we had the opportunity to communicate and keep that going. Same thing in business. If you can't meet the tenants, you've got to figure out other ways to do it. And the adaptability of Freddie Mac, by one example, mandatory. I had to physically inspect it or someone on my team that had a specific training. All of a sudden, they went to, it was their own program because that's the federal government, but it's something like a Zoom where... Um, they do a live broadcast and a property manager would walk the property. Who would ever do an engineering report without actually going to the asset? I mean, those things happen today and they didn't happen a year ago. So flexibility, diversity, and um, making sure to concentrate on what's important. It shouldn't take a pandemic to find out what your hobbies are, what your passions are, and how much you care about your family. You should be doing that all the time anyway. That's part of your self-care. I just don't think of it that way. Well, all I can say is not only was that well said, but it was indicative of what a successful person views in life. Okay. High five to you, Charles. I learned, you're going last, Casey. I learned that uh, transparency and authenticity are extraordinarily important in building your business through the internet on LinkedIn and other social media platforms. That's why I invited every person here today because I've been observing you on social media and you're authentic, transparent. You're exactly who you are. You're not making any errors and you're wonderful people. And I wanted to help you project all of that to the everybody and create beautiful content about yourself. Another thing I learned is it's going to definitely happen again. Definitely. So we have to be prepared for that. That's why people care about what's an essential, essential tenant now. Another thing I learned, sunshine always wins. Sunshine always wins. The governor took advantage of it with his political political approach. We won't talk about it other than that. Our businesses have benefited from that approach. The fact that we are outside all the time gives us a, a counter cycle to the, to the virus, which is allowing us to hopefully miss the last part of it. So I think that that's really, really, really important. Linked in the remote networking again, but the most important thing I learned is how great it is to hug my mom again. Casey, you're up. That, those, are, those are great pieces. So Jim, all of us that have watched you over the last year, we've learned one thing. The reason that you, you know, hit the ground running every, mo every morning is you get great REMS sleep. That's real estate mortgage <laughs> strategy sleep. 
<laughs> and Charles is going to have to get some good REM sleep to catch you, right? The other thing is I always have a good reading recommendation. So uh, for Reagan, we're going to send him a collection of the Dr. Seuss books. This is the adult version, Seussisms. All you need to learn about this cycle and the next cycle that's coming is in here. And my favorite one that Beth uh, really enunciated very well was Think Outside the Box. And, uh, and Russ said, you know, try new things uh, as you go through it. Um, so I think it's been an incredibly innovative time. Like you said, we're gonna we're gonna go um, go through this again. Uh, how you how you adapt, whether it's adaptive reuse or whatnot, is um, you know is incredibly important. So um, just keep keep trying. I'll tell you one thing. I'm gonna write a book at the end of the year because in best fashion, it's all about the entrepreneur right now. So. At age 58, in the middle of a pandemic, in the fourth quarter of a calendar year, what did I decide to do? To become an entrepreneur and start my own business for the first time. <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna title it, you did what? <laughs> and I'm gonna have you write the, the uh, foreword, Beth. So uh, I think we've learned a lot of good lessons here and um, hopefully we don't forget them, which we tend to do every 10 or 20 years. So good luck. All, to right. All right, that was well said. Now we're gonna go around the horn and we're gonna finish the way we started. Everybody gets a couple of minutes, a couple of words, to give their impression of where we go from here. Beth, where are we going from here? Roaring 20s. Roaring oh, that was That's okay, you could have it. I wrote that in something already today anyway. I love you. 100% agree with that. 100% agree with that. Russ? Florida, Florida, Florida. If your company, uh, Charles talked about New Jersey. I'm from up there originally. and. Uh, all I see are New York and New Jersey and Connecticut license plates down here, and they're, they're coming in in droves, and it was a 1,000 people a day before the pandemic. I don't think we've gotten the numbers since, but it's going to be, uh, you know, retail following residential, and the residential's on fire. Lori? You guys both said it. I think all we can do is be grateful for the roaring 20s ahead of us and living in Florida, although you guys did scare me a bit because if this is going to happen again, our houses are fully renovated. What are we going to do for Kex? <laughs> Charles! You know, I, I think we're on a pretty strong pace at the moment. And I expect by midway through the year, when most of us are going to be vaccinated that want a vaccine and offices return to work policies are unequivocally clear, we could be in a full tilt sprint to the end of the year. I'm looking forward to that. A hundred percent. Casey, what's all that going to mean to interest rates? So, uh, apologize to the background noise. They're doing the renovation. They decided we don't to start care. Off the we course. don't care. We don't care. We don't hear yeah. it. So what I, what I worry about, I'm hoping it's the roaring twenties. I fear though, that the, what's going on with Fed and in Washington DC right now, this could be the Jimmy Carter administration, the return of the misery index, devaluation of the dollar and massive inflation as the unintended consequences of a Federal Reserve that is just printing uh, with Treasury and Congress are just printing money out the wazoo. And that's why Bitcoin's at 57,000 a day. That's why the 10 year Treasury is going up. So all the good we talked about could be unwound by what's going on with the Fed and monetary policy. So I stay awake a lot. I was on a special program last week, the Griswold Center at Princeton. So uh, Monmouth, who I'm on their board, was nice enough to let me fill in in, in their position. And we had Chairman Bernanke uh, speaking. And, and I asked him about the Fed's balance sheet monetary policy. He says, it's never going back to $1 trillion. It's not even going to go back to $5 trillion. It's a new era. We'll be lucky if we keep it under $10 trillion. Worry about that and what that means for commercial real estate, because it's that cost of capital, as Charles knows, that makes it work. Uh, I, I, can, I can take from my, from my perspective. I got the construction going on over here. Don't think you're the only one. The one thing I learned is that we're not the only ones. We're all in this together. The way we stay resilient is by being together. And that's why I wanted to bring you all here today because I want to show everybody what that means. There you go. Bye-bye. Good night. Everybody take care. I love you. Remember, I'm going to do the close now. I forgot to do that because I was loving you guys up so much. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. I want to thank our sponsors. Shout out to the first responders, healthcare heroes, all those great people. The auto mechanics even. How about them? Warren Henry Automotive, the Creco AI, Carlson Integrated, Turkel Brands, Bergstrom Center for Real Estate Study. Beth, what's the FSU Center called? The Center of Real Estate for FSU. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. 
But I really want to thank the listeners, the viewers, all the people that have been here today. Go to our Facebook page, all our other social pages, like the show, tweet the show. Give me all the love on LinkedIn I can have. Join our community, Facebook, Twitter, all of them, even Twitch. Can you believe that? Are you guys on Twitch? If you missed today's show, it'll be up immediately on LinkedIn, later today on everything else, especially YouTube. This is Jim Freed for Freedom Business. Look for us next week right here Wednesday at noon. What are we going to talk about? I'll figure it out by then. Remember, the person who wants to do something finds a way the other finds an excuse. Now go out there and make it happen. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Reagan, it is yours, sir. I love you guys.